Hi, and welcome everyone. Um, my name is Mary Waldron, and I'm the interim president of the Downtown Brockton Association. I just want to be able to say thank you to those who are here in person. We have about five people who are online by way of Zoom, who are interacting by way of, um, through hybrid from their home, but still becoming engaged in this world of technology we have. I just want to give a shout out to my office staff, um, Megan Fournier and Sean Noel who are here, but also John Fay from the planning office. But in the audience, we do have a number of folks um, with us today is also Robert Jenkins, the direct, executive director of the Brockton Redevelopment Authority. And um, we will say hello to him and have him participate. But um, again, this is supposed to be really free flowing in terms of your interaction. But there first are going to be some presentations. Um, I have been involved with this probably for about six, seven months now, maybe even more. Um, through, um, it's really through a, a grant for mass development, just to do this feasibility about getting engaged and becoming engaged, and we've started growing this group to get more people, focus groups, hear from you. It's, it's continual, it's not stopping, um, but it really is important that we continue to have the dialogue with property owners, business owners, visitors, residents, just stakeholders, people who just want to see some things happening here in Brockton. So um, I want to be able to just say thank you to all those who are here. Um, but I would like to bring, um, I've been so um, amazingly honored to be working with Anne Ann Burke, um, the consultant that has been hired by the planning office and it was a, a grant through Mass Development and Amanda from Mass Development is here. So thank you Mass Development for giving this opportunity. Without further ado, I would like to bring Anne up and I know this is kind of a funky way of doing it, but we want to be able to capture voices and, um, and topics. So thank you. Well, hello everybody. Uh, we're um, happy to have you here and I know that it, it's an intimate crowd, which is great. Uh, we'll hopefully uh, learn a little bit more about business improvement districts if you don't know about them. How many of you are, from, so those are, some of you are on this committee so you know what's going on, but in general, do you all know what a business improvement district is? No? Yes? Oh, okay. So. My job tonight is going to be just to give you a really high level look at what a business improvement district is all about. And then we are uh, fortunate to have Evelyn Darling, who is the executive director of the Worcester Bid. Uh, and it's been around for about five years now, Evelyn, right? Three. Three years, okay. And Chris Russell, who is the <laughs> executive director of the Springfield Bid. And the Springfield Bid is the first bid in the Commonwealth. Um, it's been around for 22 years, years, 23 years. I, I actually had the pleasure of starting this, that, that bid. So um, it's come a long way, doing lots of different kinds of things. It has evolved, as bids do over time, to try to address what you want to do as priorities in your community and what's a, what, what you can actually do to, to achieve. So we thought it was great to have two gateway cities, in Springfield and Worcester, to talk about, because there are probably some similarities here in Brockton with the kinds of things that, that you're uh, working on and the things that Springfield and Worcester have been working on as well. So I'm going to, with that, uh, John, we're, we don't have a clicker, so John, I'm going to be doing the, here you go. So it's a uh, business improvement district. So a business improvement district is a legally defined area uh, of geography, most of the time it's a downtown, in which, in which uh, property owners initiate, plan, uh, manage, and, fu and fund uh, supplemental services and these supplemental services are designed to be things that they that you create your vision what do you want to have accomplished in your in your district and and you decide these are the kinds of enhancements that make sense to, to, to really achieve those those economic and social goals within your district and there are thousands of business improvement districts all around the country they work they've been around for 60 years and you'll see multiple business improvement districts in in large and small cities wherever you go in progress. We have 10 business improvement districts in Massachusetts. They range in size from budgets of $6.5 million in downtown crossing to Hudson with a budget of about $120,000. And Hudson has just been named uh, the best Main Street in the USA in large part for the work that their bid is doing. So John, um, the, some of the reasons why, what are the benefits of forming a bid? Uh, they, are, they give you the opportunity, and I'm not sure why this isn't all fitting on the screen, but to make strategic investments, to drive your own local priorities. So you're investing in, your, in whatever you have designed locally. They are nimble. They allow you to respond to crises or take advantage of opportunities that might be out there. They have, provide sustainable and predictable finances. 
And one of the most important things is they provide a unified voice and advocacy. So every uh, mayor or city manager I ever talked to says, I, I would much rather hear from an organization that says, these are the priorities of our districts. These, and, and, and you are able to then uh, use this organization to help you advocate for the things that are important for, for your district. They're directly controlled by your members, your property owners and businesses that are part of the of your bid and um, all bids are formed as, as, as 501c3s which allow and with the board of directors and you provide the governance for what happens within your district. Join us. John. So as I said, the kind, these are designed to be supplemental services and we like to use the, the, the example of the town, the, most cities and towns try to do the absolute best they can within their communities and provide the level of services that they, they want to be able to provide in their downtowns. Sort of like the, bit, the city takes you out for a pizza and you, they're going to say, we have the money to buy you a cheese pizza, but you really want pepperoni and sausage and other kinds of things. Those are the enhancements that an organization like this can provide. They are the, the bells and whistles that make your, that help you create a, a special place, a destination where people want to invest or shop or lo live or locate their, or buy properties or do development. Those are the kinds of things that, that create your place. Um, so they're designed around local governance, local priorities, strategic investments for scale, and they're also, they're also very effective at leveraging their dollars. So you may generate a budget of X, but bids, if they're good, and Chris is very good at this, so he'll be talking about how they leverage those dollars out uh, multiple times over. We had a meeting in Central Square in, in Boston uh, last week with uh, uh, some visitors from Fall River and some, some visitors from Brookline, and one of their property owners said to us, for every dollar that I invest in this district, I get $10 back in services because it, it leverages those dollars out many fold. John? I'm going to just quickly run through a, a few high level things that bids do. So bids work on things like business development, and I'm not going to read all these things because you will be, we're going to post this up on, online so you'll be able to see um, the kinds of things that they do. But this could include business recruitment, programs, um, market studies, uh, uh, facade programs, merchandise support. Some bids actually do real estate development. You'll see bids around that do those kinds of things. And they advocate for the business community. They're very active in placemaking. So things like lighting and farmer's market and performances and art installations, landscaping, all of those kinds of enhancements that really help you feel like the places it, that you create this place. It's a really, you're creating your own destination. So these are the kinds of things that are more than a bench, but it's an intentional way of thinking about the physical design, the, the, the physical improvements you make in a space, how it's programmed, the activations that happen. Those are the kinds of things that help you create that pl those place-making activities. There, many bids are very heavily involved in arts and culture and cultural exploration. These are creating s experiences or celebrations, giving more reasons for people to come. You have a brewery, a new brewery in town. You want to be able to have more reasons for people to come to your, to your downtown. And uh, many bids are very active in those kinds of programming. These are a couple examples of Starlight Theater, if you haven't been to it, in Cambridge. Some uh, celebrating your, your cultural diversity, doing murals, and, and really creating a, 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 a special dynamic using arts and culture. Um, many bids get involved with marketing and creating, you know, other kinds of destination drivers, public relations. This is going to be collaborative marketing efforts, <laughs> restaurant weeks, um, seasonal celebrations, uh, signature events. You know, a lot of bids will, might have a big jazz festival or they might have uh, another kind of a big signature event that you might be known for within your community. Many times bids deal with the nuts and bolts of just landscaping. And, and, and maintenance. Uh, I love this picture. This was an example of, of one of the bids and they, they, they managed to extract about 30 years worth of stickers that were on, on, a, 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 on, a, on a light pole. That, um, those little levels of, an, of maintenance that you might not see. Some bids get involved in, in snow removal, hanging baskets, other kinds of plantings, things that beautification and things that cities typically can't afford to do, or they, it is not appropriate for them to do them and to maintain them well. But bids take on those kinds of things. And many bids get involved in, in other sorts of ways to support um, how do people move around their district. So they could be, it could be doing parking analysis, it could be uh, dealing with ballet programs, it could be identifying um, 
um, electrical outlets for to, to charge your cars or other kinds of ways to help people navigate your district and do it well. So how do we get started? So right now we're, we're in the, the starting process. We're working with, with stakeholders, property owners, the city to try to, John, did that? To, uh, to look at how do we create a bid. So the bid is formed, it's actually formed by, by legislation, Chapter 40 enabling legislation that allows municipalities to create bids. It has to be a, conti a contiguous geographic area. 75% of that geography has to be used or, 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 or uh, used for um, commercial, retail, industrial, or mixed use zoning. Typically that's a low bar for downtowns. Most downtowns do that. Uh, they're established through a local petition process and they are renewed every five years by the property owners within the district. So in, in forming a bid, next one, slide John, there are four phases. Uh, there's a feasibility phase, there's a creating a bid plan, there's a petition process, and then initiating your operations. So we're kind of in the little past the feasibility phase, we're, start, we're, we're doing a bunch of engagement uh, pieces to try to find uh, to talk to, a, we have a, formed a steering committee. That steering committee is continuing to be built out. But we're also, we've done some focus groups. We're doing surveys. We're doing meetings like this to try to inform people about the concept of the bid, but also to hear from you about what are your priorities? What are the kinds of things that you think would have a return on your investment that would add value to your downtown, that would help the downtown be more economically and socially vibrant? So we are in sort of this planning stage right now. We're doing a lot of uh, engagement and outreach. And the outcome of that will be to create a plan that will then form the petition that needs to be supported by 60% of the property owners within this district to, and that represent 51% of, of the assessed value. So that petition will have a plan. It will have a budget, a fee structure, a, uh, a, uh, bo the, the, the boundaries, uh, and uh, provisions for hardship. So if a property owner has a, a, a significant hardship, the bid can deal with the, a way for the, that property owner to be to pro provided relief for some period of time in order for the bid to move forward. So that's where we are. So those are the four phases. We're sort of in the planning phase now. We're continuing to test the feasibility to see if there's support for this district. And um, that's what we're going to be doing over the next couple of months. So we're looking for your involvement in, in um, and how do we create that plan. I'm going to stop there. We're, I'm going to pass this along because we have Chris and Evelyn. And I wanted, we wanted to take the opportunity tonight to um, learn more about two specific bids that are in Massachusetts, one that's relatively new, one that's been around for a while, to find out the programs and services that they're doing. Then we're going to have about a half an hour for questions and answers. And so if you have a, if you have a thought or a question for me, just jot it down and we'll, we'll deal with it at the end. Okay, with that, um, Chris, you're up next. I'm left-handed, so this feels weird over here. Uh, this way. Yeah, there we go. Uh, thanks for, can everyone hear me if I just not use this? Yeah. Okay, I'll speak loud, I'll leave it up here. Um, thanks for having me. Um, it's wonderful that you are investigating, looking into for the formation of a bid. Um, I can attest uh, the Springfield bid is the first bid formed in the, in the state of Massachusetts, like Ann had said earlier. It's been around since 1999 in operation. Um, I've now been there about half of its life, uh, 10 years in January, um, and, it's, and it's, a, it's a wonderful organization. Um, I, uh, I'll start, you can go on to my first slide, and I'll tell you a little bit about what we do. Um, one of the big things we're doing right now is marketing. Uh, so we, we market the city for outside visitors. Our downtown in Springfield um, does not have a large population that lives in the downtown. So a lot of the people that come to visit, we have to draw in from the suburban towns around us. Um, so we take, you know, we take marketing to the next level. We leverage our resources with all of our partners in the downtown. So we're supporting our property owners by supporting the businesses that are tenants in their buildings. Um, you can go on to my, uh, we have, okay, I'll go back to that. We have over 30,000 followers on our social media. We do traditional media. Uh, we do a downtown newsletter, what's happening in downtown. 
This is a free newsletter. We don't charge for this. And we have over 14,000 readers that get that weekly that advertise from apartment rentals to concerts to vacancies in buildings for offices, apartments, the whole nine yards. So that goes out to approximately 14,000 people weekly. Um, our open rate on that is 6.5%, which is, which is tremendous. So people are use, using that, that resource. This is good. I can actually see what's going on over there when you change it. Um, beyond the downtown. One of the things that we looked at uh, with the resources, and I, let, me, let me back up too. So Springfield's bid is not the largest bid in the state. Uh, downtown Crossing is. Our budget, the bid fees that the property owners pay are approximately $850,000 a year. One of the things that I'm most proud of um, is two to three years into my tenure, um, we started leveraging the resources that came in from the property owners and now two and a half times what the property owners comes in to the organization as revenue. Um, and that's revenue generated through sponsorships, programming, grants, leveraging our money to chase other dollars for a whole host of different reasons. So when I talk about one of the, one of the ways a bid can be nimble and change kind of on a dime, unlike the municipality, um, and that's why they love having us around, uh, when COVID struck, uh, the sky was falling. Everybody didn't know what was going to happen next. We were going to be closed for two weeks and then back, back to normal. And then it was two months and, and longer. And then people were contemplating not going back to offices. What do you do, right? So we saw this exodus from New York City and a little bit from Boston at that time. So we took advantage with a big marketing campaign in the metropolitan New York uh, and Boston market and began attracting not only businesses, but residents and investors to the city of Springfield. Um, so that's uh, beyond just our what's happening, what's on special at a local restaurant or bar. That was our larger marketing campaign that's already produced four new restaurants in the city of Springfield in the last year and a half. So um, I'll go on to programming. Okay, so one of the things that we do, uh, you know, Years ago, the streets were quiet. We don't, have, we don't have a large downtown population. We wanted the streets to look active, fun. You know, what's happening here? So we have events 12 months out of the year. When we started putting these events on, we went to a large corporate partner, which was Mass Mutual. Uh, they undertook some initial funding, but all the programs that we run now, over 100 events a year, are now put on all with outside dollars. There's no property shareholder money that goes into any of these events. As a matter of fact, we raise excess dollar that we go back into capital improvements in the downtown. That's just more of what I was talking about. We can get to the next one. Uh, Springfield bid investments. Uh, this, is a, this is another angle. Um, we've, we've partnered with Mass Development. We have a TDI. We had a fellow in the city. Uh, so that was the state's transformative development initiative. We participated in that. We were one of the partners that uh, vied across the state to bring a fellow in that was you know, uh, funded by Mass Development originally. It was a wonderful program. We took full advantage of it. Um, and, uh, and through that, we took in hundreds of thousands of dollars in investment from Mass Development. We then leveraged that actually into property ownership. Uh, we own a building that was going to get purchased by, and I'll, I'll say in quotes, a church. It was a church in name. Um, we saw this happening in the heart of what was a budding dining district and said, this probably isn't a good fit. So we actually uh, partnered with Mass Development. They, they purchased the property originally and then transferred ownership to us with a large grant and construction loan. And I'm happy to say that the construction of that actually uh, is starting in two months. So it's going to be a it's going to be a brewery and a restaurant. Fourteen thousand square foot. It was the largest footprint in our dining district, and it had sat empty for about ten years. It was a former nightclub. Another thing that bids do um, that we don't necessarily advertise. We got involved prior to this with an investment through a master lease in the same dining district, which has now taken off. Um, but the problem was we would have restaurants look at a lot of these vacant spaces and say it's wonderful, it looks beautiful, but 
you've got these two problem nightclubs that are causing all sorts of problems and we're not going to get our, our customers to come down here. So we knew we had to address it. We can address it in a way that the city can't. So we had a property owner that unfortunately uh, had to take the rent and until he could replace those tenants, he, he needed to pay his bills. So we intervened when their leases expired, we stepped in, we did a master lease for those two spaces, which gave the, land, the, the property owner the breathing room to be able to let those folks go until we found a higher and better use. Uh, very happy now, and actually that little complex of buildings in the next year, the first floor retail will be 100% full. So, and that was only six years ago, I think, Dan? Yeah. So um, the other big thing that we have that's very popular in Springfield, uh, which kind of launched partially as a public safety project, but also a beautification project, was our architectural lighting program. So we've leveraged, again, resources there. We've uh, put architectural up lighting on 36 buildings now in the downtown, as well as cafe lights uh, that overhang a lot of our city streets. And you can see, I think we go to the next slide. Oh, maybe one more. I'm bouncing around. Well, anyways, they're beautiful. And you can go to Springfield downtown and check, check out our website. We've got a ton of pictures there. Um, COVID response. We were there for uh, small business owners. Uh, we immediately, in the first four months, went out and had gathered over $200,000 of resources to help small businesses stay afloat. And this is in addition to federal and state programs. So it was additional monies that we put in. We then were partners in capital investment to put infrastructure in because a lot of our downtown restaurants, unlike suburban locations, did not have outdoor dining. So we went to City Hall, we worked with City Hall, part of our resources, part of the city's resources and also some federal money went into putting sidewalk bump outs. So for a long term solution to a lot of these storefronts, as opposed to just a narrow sidewalk for a pedestrian way, they now have the ability in front of seven restaurants in downtown Springfield for alfresco dining. Um, and that really kept people afloat when people didn't want to go inside due to the pandemic. So Chris, I don't even go ahead. Tell me a little bit more about your round one grant to uh, subsidize out. It looks like outside dining. Did you give pretty much grant to grant awards to small businesses directly? We gave them Chris, to Chris, just repeat the question. For the oh, I'm sorry. Sure. Oh, because I have the microphone. So the question is, were those, direct re were those resources directly to the, the building owner? Those dollars there were, yes. Um, we spent another half million dollars on long-term infrastructure, but that, those dollars went directly to building owners to help pay rent payments, utility bills, while they were shut down. How much was that? Uh, it was, it was uh, just under $200,000 between rent subsidies, utility subsidies, and then buying, uh, or reimbursing them for picnic tables, okay. all the you know, heaters and all that kind of stuff so they could bring their operation outside. I'm just trying to get a sense, how many businesses out of the, did you fund for the 250,000? Uh, about two dozen. Two dozen? Roughly, yeah. $10,000 a piece? Approximately, yeah. Yep. It was a good program. And, and please know that's just that was only one small thing that was, uh, you know, sure. heaped on. We didn't lose, we did not lose a restaurant during, co during the cool. pandemic. As a matter of fact, we've actually grown five restaurants in the downtown coming out of the pandemic. So, where am I now? We can get out of COVID. I'm sick of it. There's the downtown street light, and this is what we talked about. Uh, as you can see, this is. Uh, MGM Resort to the right, that's the cafe style lighting that we installed. We partnered with the city there. Uh, the city had projected through RFPs to do that lighting through the city of upwards of a half million dollars. We did that lighting for $85,000 $85, for the city. Okay, so that's one of the things where we can leverage being a private enterprise versus a municipality, how we can get something done and actually take resources a little further. Um, and all union labor was used too, by the way. So um, here are just a couple examples of our, this is our main street, and you can see the architectural lighting. What you don't see in these photos is what we've also installed when we did the architectural lighting that highlights all the beautiful architectural characteristics of the building 
is we also put flood lighting to supplement the, street, the city street lights. So for pedestrians, they feel very comfortable moving around the downtown. Okay, this is the stuff that everybody hears about. Street cleaning, uh, beautification, landscaping, hanging pots. Well, this is a, this is a, I don't take this lightly. It's the easiest thing for people to say, what, you know, what do you do? Um, and as simple as it sounds, how people feel about their surroundings makes a huge impact. Um, if I take pride in my surroundings, that person that may have thrown trash on your sidewalk looks around and finds a place to put it. Uh, if graffiti goes up in the city, we have a response team that responds within 24 hours. And we really, and I, I don't like to say it, but we probably only get a half dozen calls now a year where it used to be very frequently because once someone tags a building and it goes up, someone has to one-up them or do, do whatever they're going to do. So that program is still in place where when a property owner calls or our ambassadors see any graffiti, it gets removed within 24 hours. And our ambassadors work seven days a week, nine months out of the year, and then they work five days a week during the winter months. How am I doing time-wise? We can go to the next slide. That was it. Any other questions? Or do you want to do that? Go ahead. My question to you is, what is the population of Springfield? Approximately, just under 250,000. Yes, uh, so that's a, that's a very good question. He asked, uh, do, th does the bid get help from the city? And this, this answer has changed over the, over the life of this bid. This bid's been around for 23 years. Um, the city contributes now separately from a, you know, special projects. They contribute $150,000 on top of the 80, 850000 that the private property owners contribute. It is voluntary. So with, when you're forming your bid and everybody wants to bring it on board, that would be a great time to have a MOU in place with the municipality. Um, our, our, the city of Springfield has a number of buildings, including city hall, libraries, museum, uh, buildings within the downtown. And one of the, reason, one of the ways we kind of set that was if we looked if there was an assessed value on these buildings. Um, so we have a, every three years we sign a contract with the city uh, and we spell out in that contract the services that we're going to provide directly to the city or to supplement city services and they're contributing $150,000 annually for that. And, and how does the Manorite community participate in helping out? The community? The Manorite community, how do they participate in helping you out? How does the community participate in helping you out? The, the property owners? No. Or the... the I'm, I'm, not, I'm not catching the question. Sorry. Oh, uh, the, the minority community, well, the minor, our, I guess our city would probably be defined as it's made up mostly of minorities, our downtown. So we design programs, uh, our farmer's market, for instance, we have a lot of poverty in the city of Springfield, in the downtown. Uh, we made sure when we brought a farmer's market, it wasn't just hoity-toity, we were bringing flowers home or something fancy. We have, we have vegetables from farmers throughout the region, but we made sure we, were, we have EBT and HIPAA benefits for all of those folks. So that, the, you know, the folks that live in the downtown participate in a lot of our events. We choose musical acts for our concert nights for those folks to be able to get out and enjoy, you know, a free event. Just a question. Um, I used to drive to Lynn when I was in Springfield quite a lot years ago. I, I, I love Springfield. Are you from Springfield? I am. Right. Yep. Um, I grew up next to Forest Park. Okay. I do the nursing homes. So it was very dull. I live in nursing homes in the middle of the night. But I, I love uh, Springfield. What's the name of the river? Connecticut River. Connecticut River. Connecticut River. What's yep. the name of the highway? Ninety-one. Ninety-one goes all the way to Chickabee's right there. <laughs> so, nor so so we're at a, we're at a crossroads actually of New England. Oh, yeah. We have ninety-one, and then we have ninety that intersect Springfield. So here in Brockton, we're in a little bit of a different situation. Our 
main highway is 2012. It's mostly over to uh, west side. It doesn't really help us downtown. But we do have the, uh, the railroad. And we have a development. The development actually on the west side of the highway. I just wanted to bring it up, actually. So people think about Springfield and Brockton. Two different animals. Yeah. And I love Springfield. Yeah, well, and let me, so, and I, I don't want to take much time from Evelyn because I know she's going to talk next, but one of, so one of the, so I participate with the nine other bids in the state that Ann pulls together, and prior to COVID, we were getting together every other month, um, but collaborating all the time with what's working, you know, what, does this program work for you? I have this problem. Have you had it in the past? Because every bid, every single bid, all 10 of them in the state look entirely different. Totally different. That's the beauty of the bid. The bid, so I'm managed by a board of directors. I have a board of 11. That board represents the 78 property owners. It's representative of the property owners. So I report to them on a monthly basis, but I talk to our shareholders on a regular basis also. So they're, uh, we're, we're in constant communication with what may be a problem. How can I help? We're a liaison between the property owners and City Hall. Um, so that's one of the benefits, and they're all going to look very, very different. Um, just one other thing. Not somebody else, but I'm just... Actually, if, I, if I could just go with because there's a couple of folks that are here that have been long-time property owners in Brockton, and there are some folks that are here that are new, that are opening up some business. How do you gauge that difference between someone who's been here for 20, how many years ago? 30. 30 years versus somebody who's new, and how do you... Interact, right? There are folks that have been paying property taxes and, and have kind of been struggling along these, these years. So, um, how do you bring folks together in, in that kind of uh, environment? Well, I, th I think having the, op the open dialogue with what, what the problems are and addressing those problems head on. So, the problems, I don't know Brockton's downtown, but I'm going to guess we have a lot of similarities and there's probably some things that are different. But a lot of the problems that we faced and still face to this day are problems that aren't unique whether this property owner has been here for a dozen years and this property owner is new. Um, the one thing I'll caution as you're forming your bid, and I know there was a couple times in the Springfield bids history where certain property owners would want to pull back dollar for dollar every dollar they put in, okay? And there were bid directors or boards at the time that would kind of fall prey to that philosophy. And the problem with that is now you're not compiling a mass of dollars that can make real change. You're just, you're just exchanging back and forth and doing each other favors. Um, the, the best thing I can say is, is if you're forming a bid is keeping lines of communication open constantly. And the first person I'm gonna go to is the person that's unhappy and has a problem. Because that's the person I need to address first to figure out what can we do to help them out. So uh, you know, keeping those lines of communication and having board leadership that is very representative of those different types of property owners. You know, the other thing is we also talk about the value of properties. Uh, in downtown Springfield, we have four office towers. Um, those four office towers contribute 45% of the bid fees. Now, if I only answered to them, they're not the ones that have a lot of problems. It's the smaller property owners that have more problems, and they recognize through what we do, that that's benefiting them. It's raising everybody up. So, you know, having a, having a board of directors that's very diverse, uh, that represents different years of ownership, different levels of ownership, and then also diversity in who the, who the people are. So, uh, representative of the community. What percentage did you say, Chris? The four towers, what percentage? Pro approximately 40 to 45%. Yeah, we, well, we, well. <laughs> I mean, my we, question was, I mean, would be, so what were the criteria for these businesses to be qualified for them since we picked up, you know, so businesses? Well, there were certain businesses that we saw that suffered directly from a, a shutdown. So they were, for the most part, restaurants, retail. We excluded bank retail from that program. Um, 
but uh, those were the primary recipients. But there was a, you know, there was a, a men's clothier that received assistance. Um, trying to think of a couple other examples off the top of my head. I would say probably 75% were restaurants though. And there was more than two dozen. I think the other thing is there's another program that we did after this that we went back out with and I just didn't put it in these slides. Well, yes, and, that's, and thank you, that's a good question too. So we helped a lot of these businesses with their PPP loans or put them in touch with an SBA lender that could help them get the real dollars that they needed to get through. So we were a liaison there. And we, if you look at our Springfield Downtown website, even today we have business resources on there that will show grants that are available, they'll show storefront improvements, they'll, we have a whole host of different things that we connect the property owner or their tenants to resources from all different you know, entities where they can get assistance for their property. Just add uh, one quick note. The, 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 bid, the little bit of Hudson Mass during COVID, they, they took uh, $20,000 and, and they hired a retired accountant to help that, and then they offered to every single business within the bid uh, free help in filling out their PPP, PPP, um, PPP and uh, idle loans the applications if they wanted to. 70 businesses took advantage of that, and all of them received their loans and all of them were able to, to work that out. So they offered it to everybody and even if the business did not take advantage of it, they, it was available to anybody within this district. So it was really strategic use of a little chunk of their, their very small budget that they felt during COVID this was the most important thing that they could do. So they were able to respond to that crisis. Yeah. Yeah. We did we did a similar program and we didn't we did not pay for an accountant, but we had three local banks that we reached out to that were headquartered or officed in Springfield and actually had their teams and we connected and we connected, you know, I want to say close to hundred businesses to that same resource. Are the little police kiosks part of your bid or is that part of this city? I don't believe in police kiosks personally. Yes, they're in our bid. Um, that was that was brought by a former police commissioner who's actually a very good friend of mine um, but I've always disagreed with the police kiosks um, I believe police in a downtown should walk the beat um, and that's what our metro unit does today uh, very rarely we see a police officer sitting in the kiosk um, they're the police don't like them they're a, a visible target stationary in a tiny cube sitting on the side of the road and what we prefer is here's another thing so i work with the leadership of the police department i work with uh C commissioner clapperud and the metro unit hand in hand and and we speak almost weekly or bi-weekly about different types of issues and the thing that i believe in policing and i don't think that changes in any downtown is the visibility of having police walk stop into stores talk to people find out what's going on. They don't, do any, they don't do any good in a cruiser unless they're gonna to have to chase somebody and they, bel they belong walking the beat. That's, I, I believe in that 100%. I think I have one more quick, thank you. In Springfield, you guys got the uh, basketball hall of fame. We do. Around the same time, Brockton was considered for a uh, boxing hall of fame. And it was more of a, an idea than a plan. It was no, no plan, but there was thought of it. And we got mixed on that. We just got dismissed on that in the Hall of Fame. We got built in Springfield. No ball. But I wanted to bring that up just with Brockton. You know the history of Brockton. As far as the state goes, when they go to make a decision, we don't get it. What other people get? We don't get first class. I'll leave it at that. Well, listen, you know what? And I hear that a lot in my bid because what I hear is the eastern part of the state gets everything and we get, we get the scraps. <laughs> We're, uh, you know what? It, Somebody's always going to get less and somebody's going to get more, but I'll, but I'll tell you something, but, but why is a bit important? We partnered with Mass Development. I'm knocking on their door every day. I want more, I want more, and that's what I'm there for my shareholders and my board loves me because of that. And if I wasn't there, that's one less person asking for all these different resources. So. We don't even have a full Walmart. We don't get a full Walmart. Anybody got a full Walmart. So, so let's Never mind. <laughs> I know. I know. No, 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 no. Ideally, but this is exactly what we want you hearing, listening, ask these questions. With that, Evelyn, thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Evelyn. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm Evelyn Darling, the executive director of the Downtown Worcester Bid. 
Um, and I think like Anne said, we're one of the newest bids in Massachusetts. So Anne helped us. We were a TDI district. Um, and out of that was formed the bid and helped us um, in our steering committee. So the bid was um, initially formed in 2018 and I was hired in 2019. So it's been just about three years that we've had services in Worcester with the Worcester bid. Um, next slide. So as Ann mentioned, you know, each bid in Massachusetts um, has its own fee structure. Uh, defines its own membership, so this is how um, Worcester is organized, and nonprofit organizations, of which we have like 20 or so, um, that own commercial property, do pay in. Um, and you can see the fee structure there, everybody pays the same. Next slide. So here's like kind of a snapshot of uh, the downtown Worcester bid and um, the bid fees that are assessed, and we have approximately 140 properties within the bid. Next slide. So we're really compact. Um, you know, one of the things that you're gonna look at is, is what sort of boundary you wanna form. Um, so we are not the entirety of downtown Worcester. We're just like a three block by five block area, and that was strategic, you know, that was, based on those criteria that you have to hit, the 60% of property owners, 51% of assessed value. And so, you know, we're, we're a pretty compact district. If you know downtown Worcester, like the DCU Center, for example, is not within the bin. That's a city-owned property, and that would really make it even harder for us to have achieved um, that 61%, that the 51%. So we're pretty compact. Um, we're centered around the Worcester Common. Um, and so, you know, you can see our boundaries. Hopefully, we get uh, renewed, you know, after five years. And there's already talk of expansion. Um, it's, it's, it's exciting, you know, because we don't encompass the whole downtown. Um, but we, you know, we wanted to focus, start small, and then hopefully we grow. Next slide. So here are the services that we provide. Um, and this, again, you know, Ann was talking about the um, engagement and um, the participation of the property owners and the business owners. So there was a lot of engagement in Worcester before the bid was formed. And these were the things that people really gravitated towards. Next slide. So, um, maintenance and cleanliness and safety. Those were really like key. So many people, so many property owners really talked about that. Because if you knew Worcester, like going back five years, 10 years, downtown Worcester had a, had a tough reputation. People didn't really want to come to downtown Worcester. It was dirty. Um, people felt really unsafe. So that was like a real goal of the bid was to take that on. Um, and we do that through our ambassador program. Chris was talking about his ambassador program. We have the same thing in downtown Worcester. So we actually, right now, we contract with an outside agency. So a number of bids do that, where they contract with a national organization that specifically has um, ambassadors. And so they hire people who are local to Worcester, local residents, um, who work and who clean the streets, remove graffiti, they're weeding, um, but they also do a lot of hospitality aspects. So they're on the street uh, from April to the end of October, seven days a week, 6 a.m. to 10.30 p.m., and then five days a week during the winter. So they're out there helping people. You know, if somebody has an issue of um, directions, like how do you get to the ballpark, or you know, how do I park, how do I use this like parking kiosk, they're there to assist. They're also there to help with events. So one of the things that we do you know, downtown is we do events and we assist with events. And so our ambassadors are a great help with that. Another thing we do is snow removal and snow clearing. Worcester gets dumped on with snow. And that was deemed like that's really important. Now snow removal is expensive. It's really expensive. Uh, so we try different, you know, we're trying different things in different ways to like clear the sidewalks um, and, and get that snow out of there because 
you know, Worcester can get 50, 70, 100 inches of snow. Um, so those snow piles, you know, they pile up really high. So we cart away some of the snow. Um, our ambassadors are out there helping clear. Um, the property owners are responsible, but we're there to assist and especially to uh, make sure the curb cuts and the intersections are clear, and then also to cart the snow away. Um, it is really expensive, so this is something that we're looking at. You know, we're, we're new, so we're trying different things, and we've tried, like, all right, you know, sh should we um, see if we can get one of those um, almost like bobcat-type machines, and could we figure out a way to, to get one, actually, for the bid? Um, and run that around. Um, should we have our ambassadors do all the snow clearing? Should we hire an outside firm? So we're trying different things, um, but it is, it is an important service, um, especially because we just get dumped on. Next slide. So we do um, placemaking, like Ann mentioned, and um, beautification efforts. So we have started now, um, we're now in our like really second year of doing flowers, um, and it's really, it, you know, it's amazing how much flowers can, can enliven a downtown and make it really vibrant. So we have um, a contract with a local nursery um, that does planters and hanging baskets. They're gorgeous. We also do lighting installations, so we've partnered with the city um, and also we hire a lot of local artists to do installations. So we do that during the winter especially. You'll see what we did a couple years ago on the, on the Worcester Common. Beautiful lighting displays, especially during COVID. You know, there wasn't a lot to do, especially that first winter. So we had a bunch of lighting displays um, on the Common and around in different places um, and just encourage people to come out um, and, uh, you know, come out and be safe, basically. Um, and then finally, we are doing wayfinding. So Worcester's really compact, it's walkable, but people are just used to like going, parking in the garage, or parking right near like where they wanna be, and, and not walking around. And it's really walkable. So we're, all these things are trying to make Worcester, and downtown Worcester specifically, more walkable. And to you know, unite the whole area in the district. Um, these different um, elements, especially like the flowers and the wayfinding, just trying to um, make downtown more cohesive, more walkable, more friendly, attract more people. Um, and we were able to get a grant from the Mass Office of Travel and Tourism to help support this. So they actually are funding this initiative um, they gave us $75,000, actually, so we're using that for wayfinding, we're um, using that for banners on um, the street poles, and we're translating our website into three languages, and we're doing a whole advertising campaign. Um, so that's all funded by the um, Office of Travel and Tourism. Next slide. I mentioned artists, so we really wanted to support local artists and have them help us make downtown Worcester more vibrant. Um, we have a lot of vacancies. We had a lot of vacancies, storefront vacancies, and then during COVID, even more. Um, I wanna say like in May of 2020, about a third of our storefronts were vacant. So we have now put out three calls for art um, soliciting local artists, we pay um, sitecons for them to do window displays in, especially in empty or vacant storefronts. And so we've done now 15 different storefronts um, using local artists. Next slide. We do events. Um, Chris was talking about events, so we've started to sponsor our own events. We also partner with other organizations to help them with, our, with their events. Um, you know, we're just like, we're just in the initial stages of this, but we've already seen a lot of enthusiasm. Last year, we got a grant from the Mass Office of Travel and Tourism for $75,000, and we partnered with the Hanover Theater. 
they have a new repertory company, um, Hanover Theatre Repertory. So it's, they're putting on their own productions. And last year was their first year, um, and they had this idea to do Shakespeare on the Common. You know, Boston does it, a lot of places do it. So they wanted to do Shakespeare on the Common, and they wanted to do it for free so that people in Worcester, as well as from other areas, could come to Worcester, could come downtown and enjoy a night of theater in downtown Worcester. And so we got this grant from the Mass Office of Travel and Tourism, and we just you know, spread the word really wide. Um, it was so successful that the Hanover added another um, week of performances because they kind of, you know, they basically like sold out because it was so successful, so many people came. And, and with that, we also marketed the local businesses and the restaurants around it and really encouraged people like, hey, you come in downtown um, for this free performance, but please, like, have dinner first or stay for drinks later. Um, so it was, it was really successful. And our campaign was called Win in Worcester. And advocacy, and mentioned advocacy, Chris talked about during COVID. So we were really new. In fact, it was just me at the very beginning. Um, and then COVID hit. So we reached out um, and put a lot of resources, as Chris mentioned, on our website. We did a lot of surveying and really understanding what people's needs are, business owners especially. Um, especially, like Chris mentioned, retail and restaurants and personal services. Um, we had some like um, health care and massage and things like that. They were really struggling, as were the restaurants. Um, and we were an advocate, so an advocate um, for federal relief, for state relief, and for local relief. Also, Worcester was a little behind on like outdoor dining all these so many communities were doing outdoor dining and, and they're struggling so we really helped like hey let's put you in touch with other cities that are doing this Chris mentioned you know the the meetings that we've had with colleagues across the state and like oh who's doing outdoor dining how can we get in touch with this um, planning director or economic development director. Let's get resources. Let's help you, city, um, because you're struggling right now. How can we bring resources from, you know, who's doing outdoor dining? Salem, Cambridge, Boston. Okay, let's find out what their regulations are. Give those to you. Help you out um, because you just don't have, you know, you're struggling with capacity. Let's help you. Um, and so we were able to do that um, and, and start to bring after dining to Worcester. Um, next slide. So here's some of our impact. You know, we're three years old here, but we've collected a lot of trash, removed graffiti, helped with events, and we've also, like I mentioned, we're you know starting to raise um, grants and leverage our status as a nonprofit. Next slide. So here's that parklet that I mentioned. Um, this was Mass DOT, Mass DOT, their Shared Streets and Spaces grant. So the city of Worcester um, had applied in, a, in the previous year uh, for a different area. And we really wanted to bring some of those dollars to downtown Worcester. So we strongly encouraged the city, actually helped them with the application. Um, and then, the city turned that over to the bid because the city has, you know, such stiff procurement regulations and requirements, and to do stuff fast like that wouldn't happen. But we're not under those, and so we, they were able to turn it over to us. We did the bidding process. We managed that project, um, and it, it's been really gorgeous. Um, our vision is to do parklets all around the common for different restaurants around. So we started with one, um, but it's, uh, it's been very successful. And the restaurant said that, that they, last year especially, um, they had like this waiting list for people to reserve. So it's been great. Here's our budget. Um, so we, you know, our budget is primarily funded through our bid fees. 
and you can see um, you know, how much we allocate to different programs, with our ambassador program, our clean and safe program being the most, you know, we're really putting a lot of resources into that. Next slide. And then here's, you know, here's some of our plans. Our biggest um, hurdle is going to be getting through the renewal. So our, we're up for renewal next year. We're already starting to work on that. And we see the future to be expanding the bid. I know, you know, I, I can tell that the bid is doing things and is successful because businesses, especially businesses outside and other commercial districts in Worcester have been saying, how can we get, how can we be part of the bid? How can we start a bid? Can we be part of the downtown bid? Um, so, and people say, you know, when we walk, when we walk from outside the bid into the bid, you can really see the difference. It's clean, there's no graffiti, um, the flowers are gorgeous, and it, and it really makes an impression that you're now in this district, this managed district. Well, I have a couple of questions. I mean, first of all, you know, this presentation is excellent, and I hope that it can be downloaded and be sent, you know, to forward to us. So you present to a lot of information. So, first of all, love the idea of the outdoor dining. Um, also, when you talked about the lighting, did you find when you did that lighting that it, it um, how would I say, it, lower crime? Do you work with that? So, Krista Delay. Work. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So we answer that quick before sure. we go back to after the lighting. So we have perception problems for the yeah. uh, The crime statistics were not as bad as people would make it sound. Oh yes, we know that. Um, yes. So I'm sure that's another similarity. Um, the lighting made the folks that came to town a lot, more, as well as the people that live there, a lot more comfortable. And people don't like doing bad things when, when people can see them. So no, it's made a tremendous impact. Um, and the police department keeps on us as much as we can. So that's, that's what I'm advocating, and certainly it's better for business too, because businesses suffer if the, the crime rate or the sea crime rate is high, because the insurance companies can go, you know, and uh, how would I say, escalate their, you know, their costs. Which brings me to the next thing. When you talked about, which I think is super, you want to plow the sidewalks. That, that's just brilliant. Um, can do. Did you have to pay, do liability insurance with all that, the equipment, et cetera? Okay. Yes. Well, so we, well, yes, we have liability insurance. We have to, and we have to provide the certificate of insurance to the city. Um, but each of our contractors also have to, we require, because we do, okay. we do contracts with each of our um, vendors. And so we require them to have a certain level. Oh, and the last thing, I love the idea of the art in the windows and having seen that in other communities. Did you find, after you had the art in the windows, that any of, um, how would I say, small you know, in individuals interested in having a small business downtown, did, was that, did that spark more of an interest? Did you find that, um, you know, maybe, let's say you, had, you, you said you had 15 windows, did one or two become rented? Um, two or three, you know, yeah. So, yes, yes, okay. some of them have become rented. Um, it's hard to know, you know, like what what spurs somebody to come. You know, is it specifically the art? Is it the flowers? Is it the cleanliness? Um, sure. But yes, we have we have seen a number of storefronts be rented. Um, oh, okay. We've had a number of restaurants open. <clears throat> we have some retail starting to come. So. It is, it is making a difference, I think. Okay, so you, you have benefited in the you know, entities, and, and it's been advantageous to those that were there and to those that um, come along. Yeah, because think about, you know, when you're walking on a street, and if, if all you see are vacant storefronts, and that's your yes. image of downtown, yes. you don't want to go there. You don't want to be there <laughs> versus you yes. walk downtown, and maybe they're vacant, but what you see is art. Something attractive. You see something interesting, something that attracts your eye. Um, it's such a different feel from a vacant storefront or just it's papered over. 
versus like you saw those like butterflies or whatever. Oh, was, you know? for, those, for those who might remember, it was up to, funded by the Brockton Redevelopment Authority. We did have Fuller Craft Museum that yeah, did oh, Arts yeah, in the yeah, Window, yeah, but that yeah. was about 15 years ago, 13 years ago. Yeah. But, but, but I think this is where the continuity of having a business improvement district and having the funding, again, that's the whole purpose of the continuity of it. But I mean, because the plan just looked terrific. They looked like, you know, beautiful cities that some of us have vacationed in, whether it's Ottawa or Fort Lauderdale, you know, we're I mean, that, that looked terrific. And so, no, good for you guys. No, thank you. Interesting. Quick question. For you and Chris, do you guys still have TDI? Just repeat that. Yeah, yeah do we still have TDI? Yes. Chris said it, yes. What about Worcester? Yeah, so so we do. We're still a TDI, but we're not like we're second tier now or something. Well, you're so graduated. yes, we're yeah, graduated. Exactly. Graduated. <laughs> Amanda can speak to that. Sure. Ann wants me to bring up one point because I have to go. Um, but yes, so our TDI has graduated also, but we still have the resources and the connectivity. And there's a new TDI being formed in a different part of the city right now, right. up Springfield. But the one last thing that I wanted to mention, and then you were asking about your boxing museum, right? Yeah. Well, five years ago, we lost AHL hockey. Okay? Yeah. Well, we had the Springfield Falcons. <laughs> and so when you talk about a big hit to a downtown, 38 home games, that's if you don't make the playoffs, that arguably they're probably bringing 2,000 people, but it's still a lot of people to a small downtown. Um, we quickly engaged with uh, Paul Picknell, uh, whose family has been invested in Springfield for multiple generations, put together a local ownership group, and because of our tax status, we went to Mass Mutual, which is a, a great corporate partner, and I lobbied as part of that group to get funding from Mass Mutual. So the Springfield bid is actually the second largest shareholder in the Springfield Thunderbirds. The Springfield Thunderbirds now bring 5,500 people per night for 38 home games, and we just unfortunately finished our Calder Cup run this uh, weekend and lost, but that was an additional nine games of sellout crowds. And if you want to think that doesn't make a difference to your downtown and how the businesses do, it's tremendous. So without a bid, I don't know if, I don't want to say Paul couldn't have put together to be killed, but we were a great vehicle to be part of that group because of our tax status, Mass Mutual couldn't invest directly in the team because of their uh, publicly traded company. So they were able to put their dollars to us, and we were written in as part of the ownership group where if there's any loss, we don't have to kick any money in. If there's any gain, we do get those monies, and it goes back in the economic development. For those who don't know, uh, Paul is the um the owner of Peter Pan? Bus well, his family, his yes. Family. Peter Pan bus lines. And so, but again, you have business owners who are investing in their community, which is pretty critical when you think about Harbor One or whether it's it's ideal jewelry or whatever it is. It's just important that the conversation happens. And I know, right? And you have people here investing now, and I'm sure. That's you know, right. It's, it's important, but uh, thank you for having me. Thank I you. do it. So. <laughs> One thing that I had asked Chris about, um, and I mentioned it early on, about, around leveraging your resources. And uh, Chris had, I was asking how much of his budget is they comprise the bid, the bid fees. It's about 60%. So those dollars then are leveraged out you know, to the other part of his budget is, is our, our other resources that come in, either through sponsorships, through grants that they write, or other relationships or other partnerships that have been brought in to implement the programs and, and services that are developed. I think that's that's key. That advocacy role, that ability to, to be the entity that wakes up every single day thinking about how do I make this geography better. And that's that's the whole concept behind why these things work. And I think, that, Evelyn, thank you very much. A, a fabulous presentation. <laughs> why, we, why we think about the things that um, uh, how each one of these are different. Each one of these organizations really reflect what your vision is, you know, what you want to achieve in, in your downtown. We, we were at Central Square in Cambridge a couple of weeks ago uh, with a tour of, of, of people from Fall River. And one of the property owners said, 
I, I'm a new property owner. I came into this district and I said, is this it? Is this, is this, my, is this what I aspire to be? Or do I want this to be something better? Not that it was bad, but, but I wanted to be something better. So, so thinking about you know, what your vision is and then what's it take to get there. And then how does an organization work collectively like this with focus, management, and strategies? Uh, how does that help you achieve that vision? So that's kind of the concept. That's why there are literally thousands of these things around the world and predominantly in North, North America. They've been around for 60 years. They're a part of uh, communities of all sizes, uh, landscape. New York City has over 80 of them uh, along. A lot of small cities have, have this. I encourage you to take the time to go online, you know, look this Google Business Improvement District, see you know, some of them around and what they do. Because they, you don't have to follow any one model. Your model is your own. You can you determine you know, what you want it to do, what you want it to be, what that fee structure looks like, who are the other partners you bring to the table, and what, what you want it to look like in downtown practice. So one of the things I hope before you all, we, we're going to open up for questions, but before you leave tonight, take a few minutes to just write, put stickers up on the wall, make notes on the boundaries that those seem to resonate with you. What kinds of activities or events do you want to see in downtown Brockton? Where should they be? You know, who else should be involved? Because the best bids out there in the world are ones that form partnerships and collaborations and are creative in how they approach things to help, again, leverage those dollars and stretch them as far as they'll go so that everybody wants to see the biggest bang for their buck. And speaking of leveraging dollars, we have a question from the Zoom. Uh, about National and Massachusetts Main Streets programs. Is there a connection or a role for bids to have uh, when these overlap? Well, uh, yes. There, there, there are, Massachusetts does not have a main, technically a Main Street program, but the Main Street model is a wonderful model, and in some communities that's a good way to go. Um, the, 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 the question around uh, any organization is around sustainability. So. How does if you, whether you choose whatever organizational model you choose, you have to think about sustainability and how do you get how do you assemble the resources and the support you need? So in some cases, Main Street programs have looked at the bid model simply because it's sustainable and, and brings more more uh, sustainable resources to the table. But they they have many common and similar elements to them. How about any other questions? I know that some may be thinking because, right, so the Downtown Brockton Association still exists. It's not necessarily going away. But right now it's in this transition period where there's this opportunity to talk about a business improvement district. Again, this is still the feasibility stage from the perspective that John Marion, as well as Joe Casey. So Joe Casey, the new CEO of Harbor One, um, not only has signed on as a co-chair of this advisory group, if you will. Um, he's also putting money into it because not only do I have a full-time job and then trying to do the D DBA, there's a lot that goes into organizing these bid meetings and sending notices out and things of that nature. Um, so Harbor One has committed some funds to help with the capacity of making sure that we stay connected. So that's why your emails and your contact information so you can receive these slides. Um, but I do think before, we, before I lose a few other people, this really is important to get your input. Those stickers, they're anonymous, it doesn't put your name on it, but it really is important that you now take this and then Anne as well as Evelyn are here for a little bit more. They do have to go back to Springfield, um, but really important for the property owners, property owners, business owners, property owners, right? You're here. Um, um, just even constituents, like stay involved and stay, have your voice. This is. This is not a done deal by any means. This is now to hear how this gets formed and, and how those funds, if we are going to be using them, if it is going to be, we don't get as much snow, but I, we did get, what, 32 inches in one day. And, 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 and if we're bringing more people with housing in the downtown, we want to make sure those streets are walkable. Um, so if anybody has been in downtown during the snowstorm, you know they're walking in the middle of the street and the kids are walking in the middle of the street because we have downtown schools that kids walk to. It really is important that we are doing this as a community. So I'm gonna be quiet. Um, I do think, Ann, maybe to have folks get up, or if there's questions yeah. from anybody, Phil? I have a question, I'm not sure it's appropriate for this meeting, but why is Main Street kind of be lying 
So I think it's a huge detriment to the downtown. So I want to ask you from uh, Worcester, is your main street line with yours? Yeah. So we, we took out the... the so just, if I could, Evelyn, just for one second. So just for those that are listening in, the question is about um, downtowns and the meters on, on lining Main Street. Yeah, so in Worcester, um, the thank you. Go so that people can hear. Um, they took out the individual, the single, the old meters, and replaced them with a kiosk that's a, for the whole block. Um, we do think it's really important to have meters and to have paid parking, even if it's a nominal amount. Because it keeps the, you know, it keeps those cars, um, it keeps the turnover. Well, I go to a lot of other downtowns besides Brockton, and a lot of them have thir between 30 minute and 60 minute free parking. That also keeps the parking of cars circulating, you know, in and out. Uh, and um, I just think that the parking meters in downtown Brockton we want people to come downtown Main Street. If they're over a minute or five minutes or ten minutes or they, they don't have a quarter or they don't have a credit card to put in, they get a big fat ticket and they're not going to come back, in my opinion. And I've heard a lot of people say that. And, and, and the only other thing I would add is there's been a lot of meters in the downtown that have been broken. I know that. And so on top of that, it is um, revenue that is not being utilized. But and I think it's very short-sighted by the city. So I think that uh, I've been in this business for over 30 years, uh, and, and I've never, ever, ever been to a single parking, a uh, single downtown meeting that the request of parking hasn't come up. And, and because if parking is parking is, is never fixed, it's never done. It's finished. so having affordable, uh, accessible, and convenient parking that people can find mm -hmm. is, is is extremely important. But looking at how that works, it's, a, it's, it's, it's more of a whole. Because it's not like if you take every parking meter out of downtown, I will guarantee you, Lorraine Fashion Showcase employees will park in front of their, in front of their store all day long. Not because, day. well, not they- You have 30 minute parking. So, so it's, it's almost impossible sometimes to, 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 to effectively um, police that kind of a opportunity. Yeah. So, you, so thinking about parking, I'm just saying thinking about parking, you need to think about parking in a whole. And, and like, how, where is parking located? How is it priced so it's most convenient and, and accessible to people? How is it signed? How is it promoted? How is it managed? Because you can't, it's not just one solution, and it's always kind of evolving and changing depending on what the uses are in your downtown. So, so part of what we organizations like a bid do are working with the city to really look at that parking analysis to figure out what the best way to manage that parking is so that you're addressing some of those concerns. So you're creating turnover, you're creating the opportunity for people to park and, and discouraging behavior that doesn't do those kinds of things. So I'm gonna throw one other piece of, of, of information to the fire because some, some places, some bids actually look at um, creating parking districts and then taking a little piece of the parking revenue and reinvesting it back into 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 the activities of a bid. So and people don't mind that because and if you look at Pasadena, California, a great example, they have on the parking bid stickers, they say your ten cents of your of your fee is being spent on the flowers, the 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 uh, the, the concerts, the your, your your ambassador program. So that it spreads that responsibility over lots of folks who are using this downtown and it makes their experience better, but they have a little skin in the game too. So thinking about how do you manage and how do you utilize parking is always going to be there. It's never going to go away, but how you do it well and how you advocate for those things I think is really important. And that's what a bid can do. I'd like to leave you with just a couple of takeaways and then I'm going to ask you to fill in some stuff if you can. One of the things that I think both of these speakers, it's always, I can always talk about it. I have actually formed some bids and run bids and, and done all that stuff, but you expect to hear this stuff from me because I'm your consultant, but to hear from the people who are actually living it every single day, I think is, is much more um, real. And so to hear what they are, I, I want to just reinforce what they talk about, leveraging your resources, being nimble, being able to respond to both crisis and opportunities, 
being creative. So the Falcons go away, the Thunderbirds go away, uh, you know, putting together a way to buy that team so that that keeps that, that level of activity in your downtown. Not every organization, the city's not going to, I mean, most cities don't, don't, do, don't do that stuff. But, but an organization that's waking up every day thinking about how do I make this place better, those organizations can. So it's like doing those enhancements, thinking about how to approach it, how do you support businesses, how do you help property owners find new tenants, how do you keep good tenants, how do you, how do you work to try to make all of those kinds of things happen. Are those, that's the role of an organization like this. And with everybody, you know, everybody with, this, with, with a little um, skin in the game is, is really how these organizations can work. So I, I'd love to leave you that thought to think about and to go research it. Go look at the other things in Massachusetts and elsewhere online. See what they're doing because you, you don't have to do what they're doing. You can do what you want to do and figure out what works and what's, and what's your vision for your downtown in, in Brooklyn. So I, I, I think it's an exciting time. I love working on these things because I, I know they work. I mean, I've seen them, I've worked with them, I've, I've been, been uh, working with them for years, and, and you see where they start. Well, I started this for downtown Springfield day. We were interested in two things, clean and safe. That was it. You know, that we were like just trying to make it cleaner and safer. And and in over 23 years, they, they, they're, built, they're, they're investing in buildings, they're partnering with, they're leveraging, you know, their budgets, you know, many times fold their, they're buying a, foot, a hockey team, nobody ever thought they would be a part of that kind of thing. But they're also doing clean and safe, but they're doing these other things as well. So those are the kinds of things to think about. So don't, so dream, you know, have, aspire to be what you want to be and, and, and then try to set in motion the, the tools to get you there. So I think these kinds of organizations are the things that can help you do that. So right up in there, what kind of activities, events would you like to see in downtown Rockland? Where would they be? Who should be partnering with them? What else could you do? What are your priorities? Take those little stickies and anything that you see as a priority, put it on the stickers. So we'd like to hear from you. Take a look at the uh, at the um, proposed boundaries. Do those resonate with you? Should it be should there be more or less different? You know, uh, what are the key things that should be included in those, those those districts? And we're just starting, so we'd love to hear from you. If you have any other thoughts, we're going to put these things up on the website and then to make them available. So that um, if you have thoughts, all of our information is up there. Please do reach out. I'm more than happy to answer any questions you might have. Can I go to bid as like a, a voice to a downtown business? Yes. It's exactly what it is. Yes. It's, your, it's your voice. One of the property owners in Central Square said to me, because I think I have a team behind me. So when I call them up, the bid can respond, and I, and I know I have a team. Like, I don't have to go find somebody to tag the particular Google that's tagged my building. I don't have to, I find an idea, they will help me put it together. But they, they specifically said, I feel like I have a team behind you. And that's what you can look at with an organization like this. So just thank you, everyone. Please go up to those, those um, boards, take a look, and um, you'll uh, get an information from me. We'll get to the link to the website where all the information, the um, PowerPoint, but again, thank you to Evelyn, to Ann, and to Chris, but as well as to John Fay for the planning office, but most importantly for those of you who have a whole lot of other places you could be, but this is important to you as a downtown investor. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.